or at some point soon, we hope to be back open every Friday again. We're also open every Saturday morning, following the Friday that we're open, we're looking at the sun. And again, you can find our schedule on our website. Just, you know, ask what are the latest. We got brochures here if you want to learn more about the club, uh, benefits of the club. We have a bunch of telescopes uh, that we can loan out to you for free if you're a member. And so we've got a bunch of several nice scopes. Our loaner chair is even here tonight. So if you want to learn more about that, please talk to her. Uh, and then finally, we've got a really nice uh, uh, doing side up off of Skyline that members of the club can go and pursue, you know, take your own scope up there and you get half a dark sky looking out over the Pacific. So enough of the club uh, spiel here. I'm going to pass it off now to Antonio, who is our speaker chair, who arranged this wonderful talk for you guys tonight. Thank you, Gary. Um... So yeah, I, I'm really excited uh, tonight, uh, the second in our series of speakers, um, uh, Ms. Ms. Pollock has uh, uh, been kind enough to, to volunteer to speak on the project that she's working on. She works right down the street at Slack, and um, so I'm gonna read a little bit about uh, what, she, what she's done. She's, she's a native of the year. She's born in, in uh, So. Um, and so she began working on the uh, LSST camera when she first interned for the integration of the test team. And that was before her senior year in college. Uh, that was a few years ago, 2017. 2018. 2018. 2018. Um, and uh, then she joined uh, full time after graduation as a uh, mechanical engineer. And her team has been tackling the challenges of assembling and testing the world's largest digital camera at Slack. And I've seen some photos. This thing's a monster. It's like three gig. I don't know how, how big it is, but it's, it looks big. So, uh, so Ms. Pollock grew up in Cupertino, right down the road from Slack. Uh, she was introduced to the lab uh, at a career night presentation. And I see a couple of young people in the audience. So please uh, feel free to, to ask her any questions, especially after her. But I agree, I think it's important. He sees it. Very excited about that. And of course, crocheting. So any of the dogs in my life <laughs> fall victim to the this crocheting shenanigans. So that's that's actually uh, my boyfriend's family's dog, but Phoebe has some outfits too, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so then after um, high school, I went down to San Diego to attend San Diego State University, where I got a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering. One of the first times that I had an, any exposure to the true engineering process was in the Aztec Baja SAE Society of Automotive Engineers Club down there at SDSU. So this off-road vehicle you see in these images here is like 99% built by the students. Anything that we could build, we did. So everything but the wheels and the engine pretty much was built by the students there in the machine shop. And then I first interned for LSST at Slack in 2018. There's a picture from my first internship. And then just fair warning, I am a mechanical engineer by trade, so I'll try to answer all of your physics and astronomy questions, but um, my apologies, and I'm happy to help look for any answers that you may have um, as the Astronomical Society, of course. I'm sure you'll have some, some great questions at the end. So just a, a quick overview of the Rubin Observatory. First, we got to start with the namesake, Vera C. Rubin. Um, Vera Rubin was an accomplished astronomer who specifically pioneered study into dark matter. She uncovered discrepancies between the models of what we would expect of galaxy rotation and expansion rates and observed different uh, differences than what it would have been if it, everything was behaving as we thought it would be. So this was the first true scientific evidence of the existence of dark matter. We've got this awesome picture of her on the left side there um, using or me measuring spectra. Uh, she was also known as a strong advocate for women in science, specifically astronomy. And the exciting part of it all is that this is the first national US observatory to be named after a female astronomer. So, woohoo. <laughs> The observatory site itself is down in Chile. It's in the Coquimbo region, north of Santiago. I've got it on a little pin down there on the Cerro Pachon Ridge. Uh, the base facility is down the mountain in La Serena. 
which is a kind of coastal town too. So it's a very beautiful location, as you can see. Some construction photos and one of the completed dome at the bottom left there. At the observatory facility, we've got a little cutaway view of what it, what it contains. So the summit facility has the telescope pier itself. So that's gonna be up here in the dome. The lower enclosure that supports the rotating dome, this whole dome rotates. Um, and then the 3,200 square foot service and operations building that has another clean room down there for any assembly and testing that needs to happen on site. And then the control room, machine shop, et cetera. Um, and then also the auxiliary telescope, the Oxtel is housed in a nearby facility um, near the actual observatory to uh, begin the data taking. The dome. <laughs> We've got a nice view up of the dome with some people for scale. It's a 600 ton dome and it's weatherproof and it's in the last stages of work, mostly assembled. It just needs some uh, light baffles and the final me drive mechanism, but it is some very exciting um, progress has been made recently in the building of the dome. So even, and it moves like surprisingly fast for a 600 ton dome. So I didn't find a good video, but there might be one on the uh, social media for the Vera Rubin Observatory. So it's quite something to see. The optical design of the telescope is, it begins with the um, three mirrors and then it's followed by three lenses. So it's an overall, it's a 9.62 square degree field of view. As you can see on this image here, that's approximately 40 full moons. Um, of it's a massive field of view compared to most other telescopes. Um, and then we've got the compact three mirrors, starting with uh, the 8.4 meter or 6.5 meter effective because there's the hole in the middle of the primary that actually houses the tertiary mirror. So the light comes down here, bounces off of the secondary and then to the tertiary and into the camera. So you might notice that the camera is actually pointed towards the ground when we're surveying the sky. So the system length is a total of 6.4 meters from the vertex of M2 to M3. And the collecting area, M1 effective collecting area is 6.67 meter filled aperture. And then we come on to, or we move on to the three lenses. So there are three large fused silica lenses, the largest of which has a 1.55 meter diameter, making it the world's largest optical lens. And then after it goes through L1, the largest lens, it goes into L2, and then it goes through a filter. One filter is online at a time. We've got the Ugrizi, oh, this is spelled wrong, but it's Ugrizi filter set uh, that covers the different wavelengths shown here. Um, and then it goes through the final lens, L3, before hitting the focal plane. And the F number of the camera is uh, 1.2. ComCam or the commissioning camera is has been recently mounted onto the TMA, which is the telescope mount assembly. So the Simone survey telescope mount assembly is in place. The mirrors are not yet installed, but the commissioning camera has been installed, which the commissioning camera is uh, serves as a, a test for all of the operations with the real camera. So it's got a much smaller focal plane, but otherwise it has the same mechanical interfaces and it's used for testing out the dome and all of the mechanisms down in Chile prior to the actual camera being installed. ComCam will be, uh, is scheduled to be on sky next fall. And the other fun thing is that the Rubin nighttime ops team is already observing at LSST speeds using the auxiliary telescope, Oxtel that I mentioned earlier, which is contained in the structure over off to the left. Off to the right, sorry. So this is a little peek at what the control room looks like when uh, the scientists are actually observing. And then a quick slide on the LSST camera, which we mentioned was the world's largest digital camera. Uh, the camera itself has a 3.6 degree field of view, six filters, total 189 CCDs, which are the charge coupled devices or the sensors themselves that you see in that grid. And then it's got a total two second readout time, which is pretty, pretty great considering how much uh, data is being read out. 
the LSST itself. So LSST, when this project originally started, stood for the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. And then in late 2019, early 2020, when we renamed the observatory to be in honor of Vera Rubin, they kind of did a backronym of LSST to have it apply to the Legacy Survey of Space and Time. So now it's the survey itself is the LSST. And then we've got the Rubin Observatory. But uh, the Rubin Observatory will image the entire Southern Hemisphere every few nights, taking an image a, 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 approximately every 40 seconds over a span of at least 10 years. So we got a little bit of an idea of the baseline survey in this image on the right side there. And the end result is going to be an 80 to 825 frame movie of the entire Southern Hemisphere night sky in high detail and six filter Technicolor. One of the key um, important parts of any telescope project would be why the science drivers. So one of the reasons why we're named after Vera Rubin is because of her um, impact on the dark matter and dark energy studies. So that's something that they hope to study with all of this data over time specifically, seeing how, how items move in the night, looking at uh, gravitational lensing and uh, also looking at supernova, novae. So we're also going to be, of course, at the same time, cataloging the solar system, looking at very detailed look at the Milky Way's structure and formation, and then exploring transient sky. So now a little bit more into my, my area of expertise, the LSST camera. So we already saw this general overview slide, and I'm actually going to play a video for you a lot. Let me make sure that it... Hopefully it. Oh. I'm in a theater right now in Northern California with the world's largest digital camera. Now, this camera right here costs about six thousand dollars. This one behind me, one hundred and sixty-eight million dollars. We're getting an incredibly rare look inside because the lens cap is off, so we can see all the instruments and all the sensors. You've heard of Hubble, and more recently James Webb. Now get ready for the next incredible telescope expected to discover billions of new stars, uncover millions of new objects in our own solar system, and fundamentally change the way we see the universe. This camera, the size of a small car, is the centerpiece of the Legacy Survey of Space and Time, or LSST, a 10-year project to map the entire southern sky in incredible detail. Just how much detail? This 3200 megapixel camera is so powerful can spot a golf ball 15 miles away. When the decade-long project is finished, scientists will have produced a 3D movie of the sky. One that shows how all the trillions of objects captured move relative to one another, how light bends around massive objects, and how individual solar systems and galaxies develop over billions of years. This movie that LSST will enable, it will see things on time scales that haven't been accessible before. So we expect we might detect, you know, new classes of stars or supernovae or other kinds of explosions. Once finished, the LSST camera will be the heart of the Vera C. Rubin Observatory in the mountains of northern Chile. Here, at the Slack National Accelerator Laboratory near Stanford University, scientists are putting the finishing touches on the camera. This has been a long process, more than two decades. I don't think we have any other cameras. Uh, quite, quite like this in the digital spectrum that are certainly not as large as this. Travis Lang is one of the camera's lead engineers. He's been on the project eight years. It's a lot of fun, a lot of challenges, uh, a, lot of, a lot of issues that come up along the way. Uh, you know, we only have one, so we don't get that opportunity to you know, have things of scale. Uh, so we, we have to figure it out as we go. <laughs> Just like the camera on your phone, on the LSST camera, it all starts with the lens. But this camera being 13 feet long, the lens is a whopping five feet across. That's a Guinness World Record, by the way, and it took five years to construct. After passing through the lens, the light hits one or more of six filters, each optimized to collect light from a specific range of spectrum, from ultraviolet to near infrared. Once the light is filtered, it hits the focal plane, which captures the image. The focal plane is made up of 189 individual sensors locked together in groups of nine to form what's called a wrap 
This time lapse video shows the camera team assembling the 25 rafts that make up the focal plane over a period of six months. $3 million per raft, gaps between them left than five human hairs wide. It was a delicate process, but it worked. Scientists tested the focal plane last year and produced these images. This, by the way, is the head of Roman and the Now, here in the back, you've got about 110 feet of cables and hoses to power the system and to move coolant and water to keep the system operating at the correct temperature. That's because the camera generates a lot of heat, about 10 times more, in fact, than early astronomical cameras. And the focal plane needs to stay around minus 100 degrees Celsius to operate at peak performance. Once in operation, the telescope will capture a piece of the sky three and a half degrees across. That's seven times the width of a full moon. Using this massive shutter, the camera will take back to back 15 second exposure and read that data out for about two seconds before moving on to the next section of the sky. When we read out and it's at 2.3 seconds, well, that's it generates about 12 gigabytes of data. So it's about six gigabytes a second. When we see a new phenomena occurring in real time, we are going to send alerts. So within 60 seconds of the shutter closing uh, on the focal plane, we are going to we are going to be able to send alerts to anybody who is curious. That means all of us will be able to scour LSST's 10-year movie and make our own discoveries that scientists like Rico Wexler that are particularly starry-eyed show. We expect to detect 17 billion stars in our own galaxy. We expect to find really small, the tiniest galaxies in the universe that are really, really nearby. And we expect to find galaxies 13 billion light years in the past. And it's not just the new planets, stars, and galaxies that has scientists excited. They expect LSST to give them new insight into scientific mysteries that have so far gone unsolved. It enables such a big diversity of questions. It enables us to ask really big questions. What is the universe made of? What is the nature of dark matter and dark energy? But there are also a whole bunch of discoveries that this should enable that we don't even know what they are. So once they put that lens cap back on, the LSST will undergo a series of testing for the next few months before it starts that long journey down to Chile in May. Now, once it arrives at the observatory, inflation begins, LSSB is going to go right there. So I want to know what you think. What excites you most about LSSB? Let me know in those comments down below. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up. And now I have to figure out how to get back to this. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, we so CNET came by our clean room a couple of weeks ago, and we thought they did a great job of summarizing all of those key points, uh, especially when we had the lens cap off, as is seen in this photo as well. Um, yeah, they're great science communicators, so wanted to include that in our little talk. Um, so the camera itself, as everybody has mentioned, is very large. It's approximately 6,000 pounds, the size of a small car. The, the larger diameter is about the size of a car, and then with that utility trunk coming off the end, it's probably closer to the size of a pickup truck, um, 3.2 billion pixels. And we've talked about the field of view. And one of the exciting things about the camera itself is that it's an international collaboration. So obviously we have the international collaboration of building the observatory down in Chile, but even just the subsystems within the camera, there is also international co collaboration. Much of the filter exchange system was actually built and tested in France um, by some other groups there. And so they get to come every now and then down to Slack and join us in the clean room whenever we're doing testing and troubleshooting of the filter exchange system. So the full focal plane assembly, we've got some lovely pictures here. Uh, talked a little bit about the, the, the focal plane itself, but we can see on the left side here, uh, that's the installation of the final raft. A raft is a set of nine of the CCDs. So it's a raft module it includes not only the CCDs, but all of the cooling and electronics that come off the end. And as you can see in that photo, we're pulling it from the back up into place because the CCDs are very delicate, cannot be handled um, from the front. And because of that small gap that we heard about in the video between the sensors, the only option was to grab it from the top. So there was a one person driving a gantry and slowly painstakingly pulling <laughs> each raft up into place. And you might recognize the glasses on that one person there because that is in fact me closing one eye 
to make sure that <laughs> we were getting the alignment all right um, for each raft. And then the first full focal plane images, we saw the one with the Romanesco. The other one that was a, a big hit was of the same image of Vera Rubin that I showed earlier, um, just as a little tribute to our namesake. So these were done in that same, in the prior slide, we're in what's a dark box, but it's got one of the doors off or two of the doors off in this case. So once we were finished putting together the focal plane assembly, we put the doors on of the dark box and that enabled us to put in a little pinhole projector that was used for this original uh, full focal plane testing on that test stand. And then I've got another short video of the installation of the cryostat utility trunk. So the full focal plane and all of its electronics are, are housed in the cryostat, which is this metal cylinder here. Uh, so it's called the cryostat because it keeps them cold. So it, once um, the L3 was installed on the front in front of the focal plane, then we pulled vacuum in the cryostat and were able to um, keep that at that negative 100 degrees Celsius that was also mentioned earlier. So everything that uh, we work on is very large scale. So you'll see we use the crane for almost everything. I guess maybe this video won't let, oh, there we go. Um, it's a custom fixture. As Travis mentioned in the video, we can only do each thing once. So we very carefully plan. That's one of the, the significant portions that I take part in is engineering the processes that go into actually making it work when we put things together. So as you can see, we had the center of gravity spot on so that we could hold it from that one location and have it hang appropriately to attach it onto the camera body. Um, and then it's sitting on one of the stands there. Here's another view of the same process. But so it's sitting on the saddle stand there and that's one of the stands that we use for when we're working on a lot of the internals. And then when we're doing more of the testing, we can put it up onto the higher stand. You'll see a couple pictures in a minute um, and that we're able to actually change the orientation of it in the other stand. So here we've got shutter installation. I'll let the video play. Um, so there it is. The whole camera is now in the other large stand currently pointed down. You'll see us slew it back into horizon pointing there. And then in order to install the shutter, which has to thread the needle between the struts that hold the large lens assembly in place and the focal plane. So you're surrounded by glass on both sides and you've got this crazy yellow fixture that has motors and six or five degrees of freedom uh, to really thread the needle and park that shutter right in front of the focal plane where we need it to be in order to take photos. And then we've got a, a GIF on the right-hand side of the shutter actuation. You'll notice that instead of, you might imagine regular shutters oftentimes have the aperture that kind of opens out like this, but because we're taking long exposures, approximately 15 seconds is the expected exposure time. Um, we will, oh, here they're actually craning the shutter onto that fixture, and then you'll see it go much faster than it did in real life um, to park it into place in a moment there. But so the benefit of having the shutter blades go across following each other. Uh, the way that you see in the GIF is that every pixel of the camera's focal plane is exposed to light for the same amount of time. Instead of if they were opening from the center out, then those center ones would be exposed to more light than the outside um, pixels. So that's the reasoning behind that design. Those are giant carbon fiber blades that slide across surprisingly fast. And then we can try to go on to the next one. The next um, nail biter of an activity that we did at Slack was the L1, L2 installation. So very large, very expensive, very delicate uh, glass assembly that's on a hexapod of six carbon fiber struts. Um, can't really see them in either of these views, but I'll point them out if I see them in a picture in a few slides here. Uh, and then, so once we did install that on, once again, using the crane, we performed a, a, a survey. There's a, an entire group at Slack dedicated just to metrology. So they'll come and they'll bring in their laser trackers and they'll measure uh, your hardware for you so that they can make sure that it's actually lined up exactly how we want it. So the struts themselves are do have adjustability. So we measured it and then we adjusted it and then we measured it again and it is all aligned as we want it to be. And then with the 
lens cap removed in this right hand side, we can see the focal plane. You might notice that there are two different colors going on in the focal plane. That is just because there were two different CCD manufacturers. So they just look different. They function near identically. It's quite bizarre. And I don't really know the details as to why, but the camera takes pictures um, the same way from raft to raft. A little exciting media moment. So we did mention that there was a Guinness World Record with that lens. It also holds the Guinness World Record for the highest resolution digital camera. So we can see these two records that we got to break over there. And once again, that's me. So <laughs> I'm in the Guinness Book of World Records. <laughs> yeah, if you can tell from that angle with just the glasses and the eyes through the clean room outfit, but I'll take what I can get. Um, and then we did have a couple of other local and national media outlets come by when we had the lens cap off to take pictures, like the video we just saw from CNET, and we were on the front page of the Merck. So looking forward, um, in order to have the camera all be cooled to our liking, we have had refrigeration updates, um, which we are currently testing that system. And then the filter integration, we have all six filters here at Slack. Um, but they haven't been actually installed into the camera quite yet. So far, all of the testing of the filter exchange system has been done with dummy filters, which are the exact same mechanical interface, but it's just a metal blank uh, that has the same center of gravity and mass as the real glass filters. And that's really key. We talk about how we can't really do any of the, the dry runs of things. So whenever we can do a dummy and do a dry run of all these tasks, it's really useful for our data. Um, to make sure that we don't accidentally damage one of these optical filters. Um, there are six filters total. There are only ever five on the camera at a time. So there's a carousel that contains the four filters that are not online. And then the one filter that we saw kind of slide in front of the focal plane in the video um, is then online. The sixth filter, I, I forget if it's the U or the Y, that's gonna be used slightly less frequently, it, that would be switched out into the camera during the daytime hours so that we can use it for the following night's observation. It's not too uh, big of an undertaking to switch out a filter, even though they are 25 inches uh, across. So there's special tooling for all of this. So it's all being planned out. And then full camera testing is going to occur soon. So here we've got another photo of it pointed down. This will be the orientation that we have it for the full camera testing. We'll bring in another dark box around the full uh, L1, L2 assembly there. And then we have a calibrated light source that has stages that we're able to move and angle the light and make sure that all of our alignment is correct and make sure that uh, everything is behaving as it's expected to before we send it down to Chile, make sure it works. Everybody always asks how it's gonna get down to Chile. So, so we'll cover that for a moment here. Um, the shipment to Chile, don't worry, lots of engineering has gone into it. We're all just as nervous <laughs> as you would think um, sending this very precious equipment. So there's a custom engineered vibration isolation system that you can see it's the yellow portion here. And it goes into a climate controlled container. And we've already actually sent a full camera mass simulator down to Chile in this box so that we could test out. We had a, a bunch of data loggers on it to make sure that it was not seeing any loads that it is not able to see safely. So we've already shipped that down to Chile. There you can see that was when the mass simulator arrived at the observatory and everything worked well for the vibration isolation. So when we do send the real camera, and this went on a, a ship, but for the real camera, we're gonna charter a plane. So it's gonna be even more <laughs> very delicate. Some There's gonna be people in the plane. I know a couple of uh, my teammates refuse to take their eyes off of this thing. So we'll make sure that it's in good hands during its shipment down to Chile. Um, and then of course, once it's down in Chile, they have to be able to handle the camera to get it into its place on the telescope. So we're sending a, a bunch of the support equipment. Uh, almost everything that's in the clean room right now at Slack is gonna get shipped down to Chile. So lots of containers are gonna get sent down when we do send it. And then we also have to send them all of this documentation for making sure that they're able to run the camera. A, a lot of my team will participate in the original commissioning of the camera, but for the 10 years of operations, it's gonna be mostly a team down in Chile. 
So we have to have a lot of those documents tra translated into Spanish. Um, and so we have a, a whole group of people working on that to make sure that there's no disconnect there. Um, and then also another thing is the, the glass, all of the glass components actually come off during the shipment other than the L3 that's holding the focal planes um, seal. So the L1 and L2 assembly goes off into its own custom shipping assembly. And then the all of the filters will be separate from the camera to minimize, especially with those delicate implements, um, minimize any damage that could be done during shipping. And then of course we have to get things up and running once it's down there. So you saw the, the person in the CNET video pointed, but this, this little yellow portion that sticks out the back is the camera. So the dome, it gives you a little more scale of the dome considering how large the camera is. This down here is a person. So it's all just gives you a little bit of a feeling of how, just how large it all is. Um, but yeah, we'll reassemble all of the glass, all the optics onto the camera. Uh, in the observatory, and then we'll install it onto the telescope mount assembly, connect up utilities, make sure that everything's working, and then we can start with the actual survey. So once it is up and running, we have to deal with operations and, of course, this amazing amount of data and how we're going to manage it. So transitioning into operations, there's the Rubin user experience that's being carefully curated um, to ensure that all of this great data is gonna be actually used by the scientific community and hobbyists. Um, so the final sky map will be effectively like having around 3 million images similar to this one shown here, but tiled to show that panoramic view of the Southern hemisphere sky. And then the, ob the observatory's total data holdings starting after the first data release will start at 40 petabytes and grow to around 300 petabytes over the 10 year survey. So this is a little bit of an idea of what that's going to look like. Uh, the Rubin Science Platform is currently in development. It provides access to the data set via a, port a portal, a notebook, and API, which is application programming interface aspects. All three of these have tools to query, subset, visualize, and analyze the data sets. And then also they have documentation and tutorials for new users. The LSST science pipelines are pre-installed in the notebook environment, um, along with many other common software packages. So this is kind of a sneak peek of what it will look like once we are uh, getting data out to the public. And then the Rubin data facilities at, so one of the data facilities is actually going to be at Slack that was fairly recently decided upon. And then there's one in France and one in the United Kingdom. So they, these data facilities will automatically process the images, measuring object position, brightness, size, and shape, so that it's able to send out those alerts that we heard about in the video. If there is anything exciting happening, then all of the hobbyists can train their, their own telescopes onto whatever portion of the sky that might be happening in. So that's going to allow thousands of astronomers to analyze all of these exciting things that are going on. Just a, this is a small look into the data side of things. I'm not a, an expert in this quite yet, but I did get this little infographic from one of our coworkers. So the, the main point I wanna hit here is that it's a combination of on-premises and cloud uh, data control. So that allows for separation for security concerns. Uh, since we are a Department of Energy National Lab, there are some difficulties with accessing data, even though this is a public project, there are some difficulties with allowing public the public to access data. So that's why we're having this uh, portion of it be on the cloud data facility. So it, that will be for the portal and user storage of information um, so that it can be more easily accessed by your average person. A little bit more of the details on that. So the science users get the cloud um, and the on the science platform, personal storage. We're actually, I think there's a partnership with Google for the cloud storage since they're obviously very good at data management. They have uh, specific expertise in that and they're just down the, the street in Mountain View. So uh, we're working with data or with Google to help with the cloud data. And then on premises, we've got the nitty gritty of everything else for developers and staff. So for the schedule, 
the current schedule, obviously we had a lot of uh, delays during COVID and whatnot. This has been going on since long before COVID. So that threw a wrench in everything, including our camera and the Chile um, construction. But the camera testing is from pretty much now until middle of 2023, when we then switch gears to get it ready for shipment to Chile. Uh, and then the commissioning camera is expected to be on sky also by mid 2023. And then the actual camera science operations are scheduled to start in late 2024. So it's feeling closer and closer. <laughs> and then now we've just got a lovely photo of the observatory at night. Uh, you'll see at the bottom there, there are, are great um, resources for following us on various social medias. And I think there's also a YouTube channel that has some of the videos that I showed today. And I'm happy to answer any questions that folks might have. Yeah. Uh, it just occurred to me while I was watching the assembly of this thing, this, the camera and the telescope itself is probably need to be cleaned occasionally. How is that done? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. So as you saw in the assembly, we are keeping things clean in the clean room while we're here at Slack. But uh, once we're down in Chile, that complicates things. Um, most of the camera, the vital parts of all of the electronics and the sensors is going to be fully encapsulated. It already is fully encapsulated in the cryostat. So that's vacuum chamber. No dust is going to get in there. So that's the good, good thing. And then another, so there are plans being formed currently for cleaning the mirrors so that we, we can have the uh, as little pollution of light as possible. And then there's also already a lens cleaning procedure that entails very careful deionized air to blow off any large dust particles and then you can carefully depending on which coating for the filters you can use different solvents to help clean it very carefully <laughs> but yeah so the other thing about chile specifically and sarah pochon is that it's a, a pretty clean dry uh, environment one of the gemini telescopes is already in this similar area um, so that should help and then if it is inclement weather we'll close up the dome so that uh, not too much debris can get onto the the important bits. It was actually my question: <clears throat> How did you choose the place? The location? So, yeah. Was the dry condition? Yes, dry, mm -hmm. dark, and also it's actually on Aura land, so it's a tract of land owned by I forget what Aura stands for exactly, but it's research astronomy. Yes, so um, that allows. You, I'm sure everybody's heard of some of the issues with trying to build telescopes in places that people, local people don't want them. So we didn't have any of that sort of issues with the political side of things. And then there's also this kind of idyllic, clean, dry, dark atmosphere in La Serena. Yeah, go for it. On the CCDs, I assume the CCDs had to be custom, custom made. Mm -hmm. And why 189, why not? 240 or one? That is a good question. So I think that, um, well, that was all happening when I was probably in middle school. So I don't know the details, uh, but I do know that there's some sort of kind of golden area of you want it to be large enough that it's not so many different little CCDs, because obviously the mosaic tiling por portion of it was a difficult process. So I think it was like the golden ratio of we can make a CCD that functions well and is also this large. Um, and then we didn't want it to be all just one too big of one, because if one were to go out, if, if a CCD was to fail with the current um, setup, then there's still plenty of other ones to kind of pick up the slack uh, as we do pan around the sky. But I, I don't know the, the full details as to why we settled on 189. <laughs> I think Joey had a question. Yeah. yeah. The, the pictures, the one of the broccoli and Ferris is doing it. Mm -hmm. So, that's the camera. You took an image of a very strong. <laughs> okay, yeah, sure. So, the, the picture of Vera Rubin was, it was, we were taking a picture of a picture. So, that was a printout that we had in this little pinhole projector. So, those of you who are familiar with cameras, you've heard of a pinhole camera, um, but this is like the opposite. It's a pinhole projector. So it's in a dark environment. We have a light source, LED light source inside of this box that has the picture of Vera Rubin or in the case of the broccoli, the broccoli head 
<laughs> itself was in there. Um, and then a pinhole that allows that light to come out onto the focal plane, which was above it. Um, and then one of my coworkers got to then take home and grill the broccoli and <laughs> eat it for dinner. <laughs> so that's fun little tidbits. <laughs> Um, not yet. Uh, it, so the observatory itself won't be um, doing science collect data collection until late 2024. Um, I'm not sure about the details of actually visiting the observatory yet, because that still feels kind of far away in the future, but the, at least the data is going to be public. Yeah. 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 I'm not sure. I'm sorry. I'd have to, yeah, I'd have to get back to you on that. That is also a good question. I'm not sure. So, I'm not sure uh, exactly the difference between, yeah. So the CMOS cameras are not as uh, efficient in gathering light. The CCDs with older technology seems to be more established and a lot more efficient at gathering light. That's a quick answer. Yeah, th thank you. <laughs> anyway, uh, sorry, if you have more to question. Okay. <laughs> Also, even in the three gigapixel, I mean, the huge number. I'm curious, uh, in the manufacture, in public, I don't know if it's hard to do that, all three gigapixel are all good. Is it allowed to be of a few percent of the fifth pixel? Or Bad pixels. Because for this data, I don't know if the fifth pixel. Yeah, that is a great question. So um, as we were, well, at least from the get-go, we wanted as many good pixels as possible. So each of the rafts was individually tested at Slack to make sure that we had as, as few as possible dead pixels or bad pixels um, before we installed them onto the camera. And then the reason why we took those photos that we saw of the broccoli and of Vera Rubin was to test once they've all been integrated that we didn't damage anything during integration. So we're going into it with as close to 3.2 billion pixels as possible. And then over time, if some of them do degrade, then that's just something that the, the team will have to deal with in um, during data collection. Yeah, I have a question, it's totally related to that. So it had to be designed or made like a long time ago, right? So yeah, you're always a little bit behind what today would be for sure do it all over again. True. Yes, yes, that is a good point. When were when were the uh, um okay, let's see. I don't know when they started being built, but I know that we got the last raft at Slack in 20 like late summer of 2018. So we yeah, that was when we received the last uh assembly of uh CCDs. So Presumably, quite a few years prior to that was when the original design was created, but not sure about the exact details. Yeah, uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation, by the way. And um, I just you, I, I like the idea of that uh, data science platform, mm -hmm. the community kind of uh, openness of it. I was wondering, um, the in a sense, data stream, right, coming from the camera. Um, I guess you guys have some kind of raw data level, right? And then it gets somehow reprocessed or some you know, redact reduction kind of stuff, right? Whatever you want. Um, and then eventually, I assume it will be stored somewhere for people like me or some other fans and, uh, you know, uh, to, to look at it, right? Mm -hmm. However, uh, the alarm concept, I think. Would that be something real time essentially? Or so what is the difference between pre-process data or post-processing in a sense versus real time availability? What are the things in Yeah, that's a great question. I so I don't know the exact details of um I know for a fact that we are intending to have those alerts going out that at least have um, you know, the bare bones details about what might be going on in this location and then the coordinates to for folks to train their their own hobbyist telescopes onto. 
Um, I don't know the exact details about the actual processing of the data, but there is, I know that there is a fiber that has been run from Chile uh, to the US that we're able to then get the data as fast as possible to the processing facility at Slack um, before processing it and releasing uh, the data out to the public. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, why does it have to be so big? Why does the camera have to be so big? Um, that is a good question. So the big camera is able to take really big pictures of the sky. So then we can have more information in each picture. Um, I guess that's the, the long and short of it, but yeah, it would you wouldn't be able to get the those high quality pictures with a much smaller device. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. What happens in year ten? So like the, the ten year movie. So like the thing doesn't evaporate. Thing. That's correct. Yeah, so I don't know if you caught it, but at one point I said for at least 10 years. So that, I, that's the goal for all of these mechanisms and whatnot. They're designed and tested to be able to function for at least that 10 years. Um, I'm sure you've seen lots of the implements, you know, sent out into space by NASA and whatnot operate well beyond their intended lifespan. So I don't think that there's any intention to just cut off and stop right there at the time. Are there any planned replacements? I mean, obviously you have access to the same money. Some yes. Oh yeah, that's a great that's a great question. So we have we have actually spares of a lot of those mechanisms. So we have a spare, what we call the auto changer, is the mechanism for moving the filters in and out of their location in front of the focal plane. So the auto changer and the shutter itself are two of the things that are seeing tons and tons and tons of cycles. We have spares of both of those. Mm -hmm. Um, so we've done lots of benchtop testing such that hopefully we don't have to do maintenance too frequently, but if we do need to make, uh, uh, perform maintenance on one of the shutter units, we can remove that, put in the spare while we're fixing up uh, whatever needs to be fixed on the other unit. Yeah. So they had a comparison with a standard camera lens, and then there's this giant lens. Yes. So what's, what are similarities with the camera lens that we all know and then with this one. I mean how many lens elements and I assume it's fixed or not or what's you know can you help us understand this? Yeah. Yeah. So the yeah the the L1, L2, L3 are all fixed. Once we've done all of our alignments, we lock them in place. So they are fixed on the camera itself. Um the so there are three actual pieces of glass. The L1 has a convex front and then concave back. The L2 has a, one side is convex and one side is concave. And then the L3 has a flat and a convex surface. So there's, I know that there's like some nice uh, cutaway views that show all of the, the details of the optical uh, system, but I, that's about as much detail as I have got uh, stored in. So it's got full color correction, right? So it's... <laughs> So, well, uh, yeah, so I, I believe that the silica lenses are all full color correction. And then we've also got the, the filters themselves are coded for the various different wavelengths um, to allow each one through. What about lecture? I mean, it's... That's Another good question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we've already done the metrology with it pointed down. So one of the great things about the design of it being pointed mostly down is it's it doesn't have to be, you know, suspended out on the more scary <laughs> orientation of having everything off to the side like this, mostly just going to be within uh, varying degrees of pointing down. But we have already done tests and those carbon fiber struts are amazingly um, solid. And so there's only a very minimalistic amount of flexure, but we also can correct for that in the, the data processing. Uh, I do not know. I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah, it's it has to still be able to see out of the dome. So that's, yeah. Question. Yeah. What is your favorite mechanism? My favorite? <laughs> hmm. I think that the the shutter is very cool to watch in real life. It goes very fast, like very fast. So I'd, I'd say just with the sheer size of that thing and its blades. So it's, yeah, I think that's one of the more interesting ones. The carousel of the filters is also cool because it spins around also quite quickly. 
Um, I'm sure as we get the actual filters installed in there, some cool new videos will be coming out on the various social media so that everybody can get to see them, not just us in the clean room. It's the great part of having a public, public involved project. But yeah, oh, just one last thing that I totally forgot to mention that you might be thinking about is Starlink, <laughs> the satellites that Elon Musk keeps putting up there. I'm sure as astronomers, you all, yeah, boo Elon. Um, anyway, <laughs> but uh, for, no, worries, no. <laughs> um, but so actually one of the heads of our project has met with Elon himself to ask him, please, please like coat your, your satellites in, you know, optical matte black and stop putting blinking lights on them. So there, there are, there are things we've done to try to prevent as much streaking as we can. But the other thing is with uh, an instrument like ours that has such a, a wide field of view, we can actually do a good amount of um, effectively erasing the streaking that does go across during the long exposure since the objects are moving. Um, and there's, it's a headache for the scientists, but they are already thinking about it. So, so I had a, a question. Um, this is going to be position on the southern uh, hemisphere. Any plans for doing it for the northern? Not that I know of. So that's actually a, a great question as well. Um, as I'm sure you're all aware, a lot of telescopes, you know, have their counterpart in the northern and southern hemisphere. Mm -hmm. So far there are not any plans of a similar instrument in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, maybe once we're up and running, they'll realize that it would be, you know, as useful as um, the one down there to have another one somewhere in the Northern Hemisphere, but currently no plans that we know of. Thanks to binoculars. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Hopefully, you know, a second question, mm -hmm. insurance for this thing? That, you know, I have no idea. <laughs> I am not sure about, uh, like, if we were to break it, <laughs> we try not to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you say that the wraps, they're going to be shipped separately? Oh, the wraps are in place permanently. So the only things that come off the camera for shipment are the glass portions. So the filters and the L1, L2 will come off. Um, but everything else stays put together. Any any questions from people on the Zoom? Yeah, I, uh, yeah, we have one about the pixel size, but yeah, yeah. yeah sorry. <laughs> and I have a, one quick question. So, as far as the little areas that uh, are between the the, the CCDs, yep, are they going to do a step exposure at all, or just as they rain, go night by night, just the randomness of that will fill in the yeah. gaps type of a thing? Yes, option number two. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. so they want. They'll take, uh, I think the plan is to take two different pictures in each location on any given night, but it's not going to be moved between those two. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you.